Hi, I'm Michael Katz. I am the creator of Riot Earp and a number of other comic books that are coming in the next few months, as well as a few prose projects. Uh, you can find information on my website, stridernolan.com, or my Twitter is stridernolan13. And I am here with uh, Kurt on Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, needs everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. Of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We are joined by a multi-talented creative person. Such works as Riot Earp, as well as an upcoming series called Golden Years, and of course, Smuggler's Blues, which is uh, an offshoot of Riot Earp. We're joined today by the ever-talented Michael S. Katz. How are you doing today? I'm good. Thanks for having me, Kurt. For those that don't know anything about yourself as a creative person, tell us who you are and what you're bringing to Two Geeks Talking. I started out as a comic book fan when I was seven years old, so we're, we're talking over 40 years. 2002, I started a, a publishing company with some other individuals, and we did prose. And I wrote my own first book, I think in 2008, i have done a couple novels. Something that I always wanted to do was comic books. I started when COVID hit. I had more free time because I didn't have to drive to work every day. I found myself making some connections, putting some things together. I had worked with a company called Visionary you know, years ago. Um, we had put together an anthology. And then they had wanted to do a comic series uh, based off the role-playing game Deadlands. Oh, nice. My company helped produce this uh, four-issue miniseries, and Ron Mars was the editor-in-chief of all those books, and he wrote one of those books. And when I, the time came for me to do my own comic, I reached out to Ron to see if he would uh, be willing to edit it for me to make sure that I was, you know, on the right track. Uh, yeah, if it was going to be lousy, I wanted to know up front yeah. and, yeah. and I want to cut the cord if I had to. You know, everything went well. Ryder was my first project. One of my business partners said, why don't you get Ron to write a story for Ryder? And that's what Smuggler's Blues is. It's the actual uh, story name for the Ryder special, which is coming out on Kickstarter next. I thought, well, I got Ron. How about Daryl Banks? Yeah, you because know, Ron and Daryl, well known for the the famed uh, Kyle Rayner Green Lantern arc, which lasted almost a uh, hundred issues, I guess. And Daryl was in the special is going to be a forty page story by Ron and Daryl. I, I help plot because it is not my character. And then we've got two backup stories, one by me, and the the regular series artist Fred Bennis. And another I wrote with art by uh, a Brazilian artist named Joel Souza, who's got kind of a, a Bruce Tim style to him. Oh, wow. And that is that story is Christmas themed. Um, I just came up with it just a few weeks ago. I thought, you know, it'd be cool. This thing's going to be out in time for Christmas. Let's throw in a bonus story. It's going to be a fun book. It's going to be a cool book. It's going to have a lot of talent and a lot of content, and it's definitely going to be out in time for Christmas. This whole thing has been a, a learning process, and you usually think that the second would go easier than the first, but my letter disappeared on me, oh. and he had done most of the work. So I had to get the second book completely relettered from start to finish. Wow. So that added a few a few weeks. Everything's out there now, and, you know, the digital went, you know, two weeks ago, and the hard copies are, are going out right now. Yeah, I wanted to make sure everybody, you know, had number two in their hands before the third one, you know, hits the Kickstarter. We have a lot to dive into then for sure, and we'll <laughs> definitely talk about the campaign. 
looking then at you know, yourself as a writer, it's never too late to be creative is what I've, I'm seeing now more and more since the pandemic has started and, and mm. is currently ongoing as well, too. There are a lot of people that said, because I finally have time to do what I wanted to do, I'm creating this project. And and that's amazing to see for yourself. Was it a time factor initially when you, you were starting this or was it a, you know, I have to get this idea out of my head onto? Well, I think Anybody who does comics is going to tell you it's really a money factor. It's kind of an alternative to buying a, a fancy Corvette. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I could have done that, but I decided to put my money into creating comics. And, you know, hopefully it'll pay off. But even if it doesn't, you know, I'm living the dream. <laughs> it's something I've dreamed about since I was seven years old. You know, looking at your first book when you when you finally got to create it what was your mental state when you started writing it to when you finished it the story really started out as a setting you know this took place after the last election where i was you know kind of concerned about where the you know the country's going it's so it's so partisan and i thought you know one day you know it might be wise to just split the country up into Republican and Democratic territories. And then I thought, hey, that'd make a good setting for a comic. One day came up with the the character of Ryan Earp, the star of the book, Riot Earp. And as someone who could show what the, the future would be like if the, the country was, you know, so divided into partisan lines, things just started flowing from my mind to the, well, I, I really can't say it's a paper because you don't use paper. Most people don't use paper anymore, <laughs> right. but it started flowing from my my mind to my fingers and to the keyboard. And yeah, you know, as you sit there, some creators are methodical and like to start from beginning and work all the way to the end. I'm a little different. I think of scenes and, and bits of dialogue and put them all down. The work is where you have to connect everything into a cohesive story. So I had all these characters and then all these situations. And then I sat down and, you know, by the time it's all done, I got 14 issues plotted out. Oh, that's amazing. Uh, that's, uh, that I think is the, probably the, the joy of being a creative person is, is not only starting a project, but actually finishing it and, and enjoying what you're doing as well. Yeah. Well, the biggest thing is when you get a piece of art sent to you, like Ron Morris says, it's like Christmas morning. <laughs> you know, when you, when you get something that you came up with and it's down in black and white mm -hmm. and it looks like something that you expected it to look like speaking of that artwork getting the artwork back because like i said it's a joy to to get that back what was a scene that you wrote that when you got the art back you were like man this is way better than what i put down on page okay the first issue of riot Earp, well the, the first issue i released was actually a, the first two stories i had come up with i wanted to combine them for Kickstarter. Mm -hmm. It contains kind of a diehard uh, ERP on his own uh, against terrorists battle. And there's a big ending. And I don't, you know, want to, you know, spoil the surprise for those who haven't gotten. I'm hoping people will go get it. But it's a big Michael Bay style spectacle. <laughs> <laughs> and my artist, Fred Bennis, I mean, he, Amazingly pulled it off. Yeah, I can't even think of a good Die Hard line to, uh, to reference into this, but uh, mm -hmm. I'll have that means I just have to pick up the issues and, and go from there here. Kickstarter campaigns or campaigns, crowdfunded campaigns for that matter, are rather uh, time consuming and they're literally, literally like a second job or a third job, depending mm -hmm. on how many you're working. What were some of the, the lessons you learned from your, your first campaign and how did you implement changes for this current campaign? The trick is to get the the comic out there, you know, in front of people's eyes. And I've got pretty good exposure on, on Twitter, but Facebook is really tough to break through. Instagram, a little tougher. Twitter is easy. Twitter is great. Instagram is probably number two. Facebook, you got these really tough algorithms yeah. to, to break through because they want you to 
to spend money on advertising. From what I've learned from other people, for these comic book projects, you're really not you're getting your money's worth advertising on Facebook. And then there's other avenues like like TikTok. You know, I, I made a, a a short video, you know, like a commercial for each project, and I put it on TikTok. But as I put it on Instagram and and Twitter and Facebook too. It's tough to get any movement on TikTok unless you're a regular poster. The easiest way to get traction is social media. It still has its difficulties. Nameology specifically is is rather interesting because I think that really gives you a window into the mind of, of a creative person and a writer in, in that sense. You already mentioned Ryan Earp as well, but who are some of the other characters that you came up with that are part of your your world uh well we've got his his best friend bill who's a, a little person because this takes place in the future all the rich successful people have fled earth to mars <laughs> and bill's family left them behind because people on mars have a thing about you know genetic mistakes look at him you know, being a little person as a genetic mistake and he kind of gets you know picked on a lot he and her you know work for the california highway patrol in san diego and bill is a civilian employee police dispatcher and he gets picked on all the time they call him little bill but the uh, erp is the first guy that just you know calls him bill and treats him like a, a regular person and they become you know close friends there's Josie. She's a, a fellow officer, and she's the the resident, you know, eye candy sex pot who has a thing for her right off the bat. There's the captain Tanhauser, which is a an Easter egg if you know your Blade Runner. Yeah. <laughs> the cute secretary Peg, who uh, will become corner of a a love triangle down the line. Hopefully, the book keeps going because, like I said, I've got 14 issues <laughs> already, you know, plotted out. Yeah, I just got to keep this this project going. It's it's a lot of fun. And then I have other characters. Issue two, for those who haven't seen it yet, uh, is about a, a news reporter who is the descendant of Harry and Meghan. There are people in England who want to replace the king and put this reporter on the throne. Hmm. Book starts with a, a kidnapping, police chase, or winds up tagging along, goes to England. Uh, my artist, Fred Bennis, does some amazing artwork. Got the eye, which is, you know, the, the big Ferris wheel. Buckingham Palace under attack. Yeah, he does some some terrific artwork for the project. So this reporter, Al Harrison, may or may not appear again, you know, down the line because uh, he was a fun character to do. If you know about the TV show Psych, Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, so I approached Dulé Hill. Oh, wow. Who gave me permission to use his likeness for the character of, of the reporter, Al Harrison. Having Dulé, I thought, okay, next step, um, I got to get James Roday. And he, he was a lot tougher to do. Um, eventually, I found a connection. An author that I know I had worked with him uh, trying to get a project off the ground. So he reached out on my behalf, and and Rode gave me permission to use his likeness as well. The second book, this oh, is the yeah. variant cover. The number two has Dulé and Rode in it. Like I said, Dulé plays the reporter. Uh, Rode plays the King of England. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's awesome. Oh. Yeah. And there's a couple of Easter eggs in there for psych fans, but you don't have to be a psych fan to, to like the book. 14 issues. That That's a long haul, truly. And how, how many mm. pages roughly are each issue? Uh, each one is 24. Okay. Um, I know that the industry is, is 20 to 22. It's my toy box. So I want to expand it. Uh, I like having 24 pages. The Each issue is going to be 24 pages, but with Kickstarter, I want to give people a complete story mm -hmm. every time they buy an, an issue. I don't want them to have to wait, you know, six months or whatever for a continuation. And when I was doing the, the plots for Riot Earp, I thought, okay, I'm a new author. You know, nobody knows who I am. Where are they going to buy my stuff? Well, I think the best thing to do would be to have two partners. That way you don't have to wait, you know, too long as a reader to have a book, you know, a story completed. 
And then when Kickstarter, you know, the idea for Kickstarter came, I thought, okay, I'll just, you know, stick the, the two parters into one book. Kickstarter tiers are, are usually very important. In terms of this particular campaign, what are you offering that will whet the interest? What else do you have to offer? Okay, I have bookmarks. You know, they seem to be popular. Uh, I have uh, pinups, eight and a half by 11, you know, high quality pinups, uh, special art. I showed you the, the variant cover for number two earlier. That's also a pinup as well as uh, specially created artwork by Fred Bennis. You know, we have commissions. Fred does, uh, you know, black and white characters. Uh, Daryl Banks, um, you know, he does, you know, whatever black and white character you want. And then in addition to, to them, for the next project, uh, Joel Souza is oh. going to be, you know, contributing, you know, his, uh, you know, commissions work as well. So you've got a, a lot of variety um, in terms of artists to choose from. We have what, you know, what's called the Strider Nolan Sampler. That's my publishing company where you can get for four, I think it's $40, you can get a bunch of books. You know, this is actually one that I had co-written with someone else. Um, Horror Western. I have this, again, I co-wrote this with Shadow Seal. It's a biography of one of the first Black Navy SEALs. Wow. He was actually the second Black Navy SEAL. First one had it easy. <laughs> My, this guy, who is an old friend of mine, did not. And uh, he's wanted to tell his story for a long time. And I said, okay, well, let's tell it together. So that just came out um, two months ago. The Western came out last year. You know, and I have uh, works by other people uh, in this sampler. So you're going to get four books uh, plus the, the comics, you know, and the variant and the pinups for $40. Wow. You know, which you, you can't beat that. No, that's uh, amazing. Finally, you can have yourself drawn into a comic book. When I say that, I'm not just talking about you showing up in one panel. You know, your face appears in the background. I'm talking about a couple panels with some dialogue. So you're actually going to be part of the story. And last time I got uh, two people who chipped in for that. One of them will be appearing in the special <laughs> and the other will be appearing in the next write up release, which will be next year. See, I, I love that because you're right. Usually it's, you're like a little head that's kind of mm. in the background. It's just like, but dialogue as well. Jeez, where, where do they get their comics credit on IMDb? <laughs> So then what is the most misunderstood aspect about being a writer for those that aren't in the industry? I don't know if I can answer that. They, you know, it's so easy to be a writer these days. You know, I mean, anybody can write one thing. Everybody's got, you know, one story in their brain. But I guess to answer your question, the most misunderstood part is you have to have a lot more projects to unlock you have to be able to have output for quite some time because you know most people don't strike lightning their first time out it's a marathon not a sprint and you've got to create credibility and build a name for yourself and each time hope more and more people will tune in pay attention to what you've created. Is there a comic that made you feel the way you hope readers of your work will feel after reading it? Oh boy, that is a tough question. Because I don't think so. I'm more cinematic in thought. When I, I create, I, I think of scenes and, and dialogue. They're just mini movies in my head that I want to see put down on paper. I'm such a fan of cinema that there are so many Easter eggs in my comics, um, you know, and I just put them in there and and forget about them myself. That you know, there'll be a lot that that I miss. You know, for example, Herp's address is the same as the address of the hero in RoboCop. Who's going to get that? But uh, I'm watching the movie. I'm like, oh, I got to put that in the comic. Yeah. So I watch a lot of sci-fi, and I think of a lot of you know things or names, and I just uh, I'll, I'll put that in a book, and maybe someone will you know, get a little chuckle out of it, but most people won't see it. I want people to be reading a movie on paper. 
is basically the way I look at it. A lot of comic creators that have, I think, lost the thread because they have to expand every story, you know, into six issues. So it can be compiled into a trade. You know, when you're self-publishing, when you're doing Kickstarter, you have the freedom to do, you know, what you want as much or as little to fit the story. I am taking advantage of that. There's no fluff in in the stories that I'm doing. Yeah, I've got uh, these, you know, double size, you know, 48 pages that I'm sure could be expanded into, you know, six issue uh, trades if I had to, but I don't need to. And, and I don't want to, you know, foist that upon the reader. Yeah, I want the reader to sit down and en- enjoy a, a movie in their hands. All right, then I have to ask this question here. What was a movie that you first watched that you didn't quite appreciate, and then years later you were like, oh, okay, I understand this now? Boy, man, that's a, that's a tough one. Maybe Starship Troopers, mm-hmm. Paul Verhoeven. Uh, yeah, it was fun and you know, had some great scenes when I watched it the first time. But as you get older, you, you come to enjoy the more political aspects of it you know the undercurrent is this this anti-fascism mm. uh you know theme kind of like uh like robocop you know which uh, verhoven also did on its surface is a a cool sci-fi action movie but you know beneath the surface it has all these political aspects that you don't appreciate when you're young but when you come back to it 20 years later and you say, wow, I didn't realize that that was in there. I think the same can be said for a lot of Philip K. Dick stuff because you mm-hmm. see the the popularization into film format. But when you really dive into the the novels themselves, I mean, obviously novels give you more of a yeah. an in-depth look at, at the worlds that, that he created. But there are some adaptations that are just truly spot on and, and others are like, uh, they could have done a little better. I love reading Phil K. Dick, and you know my best friend does too. And you know we talk about the the books all the time, and the movies just they don't stack up. I mean, Blade Runner came came pretty close because Dick has so many themes in his work, and I, I think the biggest is identity. Are we humans? You know, what is a human being? Blade Runner was to Android's dream of electric sheep. Uh, the question is, you know, why is an android, you know, less than a human being when they have the same mind, the same thought processes, and the same feelings? A lot of the movies based on his works just don't get to that level of storytelling. They just stick with the uh, Ben Affleck action scenes, and, and that's it. What was an early experience where you learned that language had power? I learned a lot. Uh, I was a latchkey kid, and you know, I was pretty much raised on comic books, mystery novels, and TV shows. And I learned a lot of my sense of right and wrong from the characters in those books and then movies. Spent a lot of time with my dad growing up. Yeah, you know, he was always working or always out, you know, doing his own thing, you know, with his buddies. I kind of developed, you know, my sense of right and wrong from superheroes, you know, like, you know, Batman and Captain America and Daredevil are my three favorites. Regular Joes, although I know Cap has super soldier serum, but he's still pretty much a regular Joe to me. Or uh, Will Eisner's spirit. I guess I see things a little more black and white than most people, but I also have a tendency to um, take getting kicked and get back up again, like these characters do. You know, pretty much every story starts with a guy getting beat down, but he maintains his composure and he strives to get back up and win the fight, what I try to do in, in life in general. So then what is your creative kryptonite? Everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> the hard part is not being able to do everything yourself. I think uh, writers slash artists are lucky because they have complete control 
I have to wait for the artists to get around to doing their assignments. I had started this comic business two years ago, and, and things are just now starting to hit the streets, whereas I was hoping to have been a lot more prevalent over a year ago. I'd actually had Heavy Metal Magazine interested in Riot Earp. They could only guarantee publishing it digital. They could have taken up to five years to put it out in print or compile a trade paperback. And I didn't want to wait that long. Uh, and I wanted to get some money coming back into the, the company coffers so I could continue to put more comics out. So that's why I did it myself via Kickstarter. And when the time comes, I'll be able to you know, compile everything and release it via standard publishing channels. If it's a Riot Earp trade or the, you know, the superhero story Golden Years, that will be available on Amazon and you know, barnesandnoble.com and bookstores will be able to get them if people still go to bookstores. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's a few around. I mean, it's not as bad as the, the public libraries being closed down, but it's right. it's, it's up there. Um, mm -hmm. You just have to deal with bad parking. What are three things that you've accomplished that you're proud of as a creative person? And what are three things that you are looking forward to creating in the future? Starting comic books. <laughs> not easy to really get your first page done. Like I say, it took me decades you know, before I did. Number two is I'm proud of you know, actually having the books in hand. The first issue of Riot Earp, the Kickstarter. It's great to see that, you know, even though I've, I've had other stuff published, you never lose that feeling of pride of having something actually in your hand. Number three, I'm proud of making a lot of connections in this business. There's a, a great community of comic book creators and comic book fans. You know, for the most part, they stick together and they help each other. I've made a lot of connections that have helped me. I like to think that I'm here to help other people. If anybody needs something, anybody has a question, you know, I'm, I'm always you know willing to uh, come through if I can. On the flip side, well, number one, the dream is to get, get your project out there to a bigger audience. Comic stores, you know, that's, that's always the goal to see your book on the racks. Number two, I want to see Riot Earp last a long time. Yeah, I want to see that keep going. If uh, Hollywood takes note, <laughs> it wouldn't, wouldn't bother me any. <laughs> Number three is I have other projects in the back of my head that I want to unlock. Like I mentioned earlier, you want to be an author, you got to have a bunch of things to create. And I do have a bunch of things that I want to create. There are certain things that are prose projects and there are certain things that are comic book projects. And I have a lot of both. It's just a matter of time. And I actually think, you know, writing comics is, is a lot less work than writing prose novels. Some people would disagree with that because you have to limit yourself to 20, 22, 24 pages, whatever, weed out various aspects of a story that you would be able to put into a prose novel. I just started working on a fourth project. I have Riot Earp. I have Golden Years, which is a superhero book coming out in February, art by uh, Neto Diaz, Jack Herbert, and DC's own Kevin McGuire. I have a one-shot horror book that I'm working on with uh, Daryl Banks. And then I just started a fourth project, a sci-fi alien invasion book with an artist named Bruno Abdias. Or Abdias, I apologize, Bruno. I don't know how to properly say your name. You know, it's, some of these people you meet online because they're from different countries and you don't actually talk to them. I'm excited about this fourth project. I mean, obviously I'm excited about every project, but it's great because I've been doing this for two years and I had all these concepts two years ago. And, and this one's finally getting off the ground. If Ryder becomes a live action, who would be the actors that you would like to see play? It? Uh, yeah, that, that's tough uh, because 
when I come up with a comic book character, I usually base them on somebody. And Ryan Earp is based on Timothy Oliphant, mm-hmm. who was on, you know, Justified. Yeah. But, uh, and I, I love, I love Timothy Oliphant. Right. I, I think he's probably a little old to be Earp these <laughs> days. <laughs> so I don't know who could play him. Uh, Peg was based on Taylor Swift. <laughs> I don't know if, if she wants to do any Actually. any acting. <laughs> the lead character in my sci-fi book was based, it looks a little bit like Charlie Hunnam from yeah. Sons of Anarchy and, and Pacific Rim. I'm a big fan of his as well. He'd be good <laughs> for that book. You know, if Hollywood wants to knock on my door after that book comes out. Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll answer. <laughs> Yerp is in his 20s. So it had to be someone relatively new to on the scene when the time comes. Hollywood come knocking at, at Michael's door there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's well it's well well needed and well deserved. I think something yeah, fresh. Would thanks. Be good. <laughs> Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? I think for me, I would have to say Frank Miller. His writing showed me just what the the comic book medium is capable of. Uh, I know a lot of people will say Alan Moore. I really love what Miller did on that uh, that Daredevil run, uh, you know, the one seventies, one eighties, one nineties that he did with Klaus Jansen, and also his uh, his Dark Knight Returns uh, miniseries. Uh, you know, there's a lot of nods to that in Riot Earp, for example. Um, Talking heads on TV screens that uh, that give you background on the world that these people live in. The biggest thing is Miller showed that you can have adult themes in a newsstand comic book. And that really raised the level of uh, story quality for everybody. From a professional standpoint, you are a successful author as well as a comic creator, and you worked with an amazing team as well, too. And you're creating Riot Earp as well as many others that I can't wait to see in the future as well, which means you'll have to come back on in 2023. So professionally, you're successful in that regard. Do you consider yourself personally successful? No, I think to me, successful would be being able to do this full time. Uh, you know, not needing a, a day job. It's so rare uh, to be able to do this kind of stuff, whether it's comics or prose, uh, full time uh, as a as a job. On another level, I do feel successful in that I am able to create. I am able to have my comic books out there in people's hands, entertaining people in the real world and not just in my imagination. There's not a lot of people that can say that, that, you know, that they've been able to live their dream and put their thoughts on paper. It's a dichotomy. Am I successful financially? No, or at least not yet. (laughs) But I am successful in that I've had you know, numerous books and comics published. The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? I don't allow myself to fail. You know, if I had to change the goalposts to look at something differently, I will. Right, or I was hoping to get that out, you know, on the the newsstands, like, a, you know, like any other comic book in a comic store. Didn't work out. I didn't want to have to keep waiting um, because I wanted to get money coming back in so I could continue the project. And therefore, I turned to Kickstarter. And Kickstarter, you know, has gone pretty well. Uh, I wouldn't say I've broken even, but again, it's a, it's a marathon, not a sprint. So each time, uh, I hope to make more money back. And then where things compiled into a trade and I'll be able to sell that on Amazon and in stores and such, I hope to make even more money back that I'll at least break even and continue to, you know, have more output. You know, I can get out there into the real world. 
the younger generation is looking at your work and they're becoming inspired to be creative in, in their own way. And the fact that you have a, the younger generation with you, maybe they are inspired to be creative in some way, shape or form. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? Every generation has to create. That's all they have to do, but it's not that easy. Each generation should be able to find it easier to create. It would have been unimaginable, you know, 40 years ago for me to think that I'd be able to put out my own comic books. Kickstarter makes that uh, relatively easy to do. The next generation is probably going to be able to release things on virtual reality where you don't even have anything on paper. You can just turn the pages in your, your video goggles or something like that. So they just have to keep doing it. They just have to keep creating just like we do. I've got an eight-year-old. You know, he's got a little bit of my creativity. I'd like to see him continue. You know, he may not be a, a writer you know, when he grows up, but it's a good feeling when you create something and show it to other people and entertain them. If your life was a movie, what would its title be? And what would its soundtrack be? Ooh, wow. Soundtrack would be, uh, would be Tunes by the Monkees. Mm -hmm. My all-time favorite artists just have an overall positive feel to their music. I try to have an overall positive outlook in life. Um, yeah, sure, I've had struggles. I've, I've lost people close to me, and I hate my day job. <laughs> like, like quite a few people do. You can't let it get you down. Uh, you just got to keep striving. As for the title, keep getting up. That's the lesson. Yeah, as life knocks you down, just get up. Well, Michael, I do hate to say it, but that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. Hey, thanks for having me, Kurt. I appreciate it. So for those that want to support you and help you with, of course, this Kickstarter campaign, of course, your works in, in the future, where can we find you and how can we support you online? I'm most prevalent on Twitter. And you've got my Twitter address down below at Strider on 13. From there, you can get my uh, my Kickstarter links, or you can just search Kickstarter for Riot Herp. But because I have other projects that will be coming out next year, do you want to follow my Twitter or my company's website? Uh, you can type in either StriderNolanMedia.com or just StriderNolan.com. Uh, and I think both will send you to the same website if I have it programmed correctly. Uh, and you can see uh, my, my prose as well as my comics. Uh, and also I, I have a children's book coming out in time for Christmas. Uh, it's called Barry the Christmas Bat. So if you've got uh, kids uh, or know someone has kids, you want to... Uh, Keep that in mind, too. That's going to be a, a fun, uh, beautifully illustrated book. So you can follow me on Twitter or my website for updates. That will be coming out soon. Well, like I said, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talk. You can, of course, find this interview and a thousand plus others on our website, tgtmedia.com or twogeekstalking.com. That's the word, two, not the number, two. And, of course, on our YouTube channel, which is youtube.com forward slash c forward slash tgtmedia. And our Patreon, which is patreon.com forward slash tgtmedia as well. I'm trying to update that as best I can as well, too. Uh, bring back the old archive and the old podcast. Uh, so, you know, stay tuned for that. I'm, I'm working on some fine details there. And like I say every week, everyone has a story to tell. It's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening and watching on Two Geeks Talking.